Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us and the Systems Innovation NYC New York City Hub for this very, very special event. Uh, my name is Nancy Wang, and I, along with Jeff Mignon, who is also in this event, uh, lead the New York City Hub, and we are very excited to have Drs. Laura and Derek Cabrera with us today. They serve as faculty at Cornell University, as well as uh, they have founded the Cabrera Research Lab. They are renowned scientists in systems thinking internationally and as well as known for their extensive work in education, since that is the topic of the day in our hour together. They will share with us why it's important to integrate systems thinking into our kids' education today, um, even starting with the primary education years. Um, it's extremely important to prepare them for the future, and we're excited to be able to really delve into this topic today. Just a few housekeeping notes um, before we launch into the discussion. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, we will be monitoring it. We will try and get everyone's questions um, integrated into our discussion together um, as much as possible. Uh, so without further ado, we want to thank uh, Laura and Derek for joining us today. Um, we want to set the stage for our audience um, so that we all have a common understanding and we all are thinking about uh, the relevancy when it comes to systems thinking. So the, the first question that we have today for both you, Laura and Derek is, what is systems thinking? That's the, uh, that's the $100,000 <laughs> question. That's the one we get asked the most. It's the one most people want to know. Um, and it's the one I wanted to know when I did my, my doctoral research on it. I, I was very interested in it. And I, I asked that very same question. In fact, my dissertation title is called What is Systems Thinking? So um, it's a great <laughs> Very <question>. apropos. <laughs> yeah. The simple answer is that systems thinking is about bringing two things into alignment. That is. Okay. <laughs> Uh, one is one is our thinking, or what we tend to in science call cognition or metacognition, and the other is the real world systems that we're interested in. Oop. Should I wait, or I keep getting recording messages? Oh yes, sorry, I don't know what's going on. Um, okay. Okay, let's continue. <laughs> sorry Take about two. that. So should I start <laughs> over, or should I keep going? I, I wasn't sure what just happened. Why don't you start over? Because you had a few minutes in there that were important. So thank, thanks, Derek. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So I was just saying that, you know, it's a great question. It happens to be literally the question I asked as a doctoral student and the title of, of my dissertation, because I wanted to know the same thing. Uh, the simple answer to it is that systems thinking is about bringing two things together, um, one and in, in kind of into alignment. One is our thinking, or what we in science call cognition or metacognition. And the other is the real world systems that we're interested in. And so we wanna bring those two things in alignment and oftentimes they're out of alignment. Uh, this is best done by, by understanding four simple rules of system thinking, which we call um, D, S, R, and P. That is that ideas and things are distinguished. That's the D from each other. They're related, that's the R uh, to each other. They're grouped together, um, that's the S into part whole systems. And all of this is done from different perspectives, that's the P. Now there's a slightly longer answer than, uh, which is that um, system thinking is a, a field that can be thought of in, in two parts. One is the diversity and range of frameworks and things like that. And the other is the universality. So the diversity includes literally thousands of different methods frameworks, ideas, and approaches. You may have heard of some of these like system dynamics or soft systems methodology or um, critical systems thinking or agent-based modeling or network analysis, et cetera. But the second part is the universality. And this refers to what lies underneath all that diversity of approaches and frameworks and methods and there's now a, a considerable and kind of mounting pile of evidence that, that these four simple rules, distinctions, systems, relationships, and perspectives are universal to all that diversity. And this means that with, with those rules, you can kind of do all the things that these 
frameworks do. And that is why today, um, today's work in the field kind of expresses system thinking as characterized by a diversity of methods tied together by these four universal principles. So that's kind of the longer answer. The, the mm -hmm. short answer is it just brings two things into alignment. Okay, and there is one question, um, it, speaking of distinction, um, but how would you distinguish between systems thinking and complexity thinking? Hmm. Well, systems thinking involves, involves understanding complex systems because most of the systems that we are interested in um, are complex systems. Mm -hmm. So uh, I wouldn't, I, I mean, systems thinking, you know, lots of people come up with lots of different something thinking, but, you know, systems <laughs> thinking has been around for a lot of times and it's usually just a rehash of, of systems thinking. But complexity is something that uh, as of the 1980s, we started, we've talked about complexity for over a hundred years, but, but in the 1980s, we really started understanding complexity at a at a much more deep level through things like the Santa Fe Institute and things like that, um, where, you know, mm -hmm. when you're doing systems thinking, a lot of the systems that you're interested in okay. are complex systems. So yeah. you, you need to take those into account. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So before we dive into why system thinking, it's, it's a good idea to teach to our kids let me ask a very straight and simple answer. Why, why should we care about system thinking and complexity right now? How is complexity affecting the world now? Well, that's, that's a great question. And, um, you know, the, the sort of simple answer is what, what we know from complexity science is that humans are complex adaptive systems and complex adaptive systems all share sort of the same simple equation, which is local agents, are following simple rules that create collective behavioral dynamics and that those things lead to emergent properties or outcomes in systems. And unfortunately, we have a perfect example today of the importance of understanding complexity and using these ideas and thinking about big problems. So, and it's important for young people and old people, all people, which is COVID-19 and specifically our varied responses to the pandemic itself. So if you think about COVID, COVID is a problem <clears throat> that is characterized by what we call VUCA. It's something we've talked about a lot, which is a, a term that has been coined by the military to sort of describe how the external environment exists now, which is things are volatile, they're constantly changing, they're uncertain, they're complex, and um, they're ambiguous. And all of those things mean that we have a lot of connections, a lot of stakeholders, a lot of perspectives, and that the facts of the system are changing constantly. Yeah, I think that's critical. And, and like Laura said, I mean, COVID is probably the best example of a complex adaptive system that we've ever had. So, uh, you know, it's been very difficult to teach complex adaptive systems. Unfortunately, we needed COVID to make it easy. But it's now, it's now, COVID is such a remarkable example of it. Um, CASs, like Laura was saying, have these four components to them. And two of those components, we have some control over. And the other two, we don't. Yeah. So the two that we have control over are the agents or the actors. Those are kind of the people or the things in the system that are, that are acting or have agency. And then the simple interaction rules between them that they follow whenever they meet up with each other, those agents, right? Now, those things lead to the collective dynamics, which we have absolutely no influence over, that it's just massively chaotic and complex, and the emergent properties of the system, which is sort of like saying the way the system is behaving or the outcomes that it produces. So those four components, if you think about it in COVID, um, the, the emergent properties are things like COVID death rates, the rates of infection, herd immunity, the collective dynamics are an incomprehensibly large number of interactions that, are, that work collectively to produce emergent behavior. Well, what produces those collective dynamics is the interaction rules and the agents. The rules are, we have, we have two sets of rules forming right now. One is hand wash, mask, social distancing, quarantine, quarantining, you know, testing. And the other is 
the virus is a hoax, no mass, socialize, no so social distance, antivirus, open everything up and cherry pick the data. You get that, you get those two different groups and you're gonna end up with very different uh, emergent yeah. outcomes. And the agents of course are the people, right? The people that are doing all this and with their mental models being enacted. What's remarkable about this, which we're seeing right now today in the United States, is that we are literally ending up, we can see quite literally two different, two different Americas. Yep. Mm -hmm. The virus is just exposing that. The emergent property of this cast is exposing two different Americas. One where uh, the simple rules are anti-mask, no, you know, socialized, no distancing, anti-vax, and what's happening? Infections and deaths are increasing. The other, hand washing, masks, social distancing, quarantining, testing, et cetera. What's the emergent property? Infections, death are declining uh, substantially. Herd immunity is increasing. So th that, that is just an absolutely uh, you know, sad and perfect example of a, of a CAS. And why we should understand them. Mm -hmm. So what, what, before we jump into uh, the kids aspect, just one thing I would like you uh, to precise is this notion of emergence. Yeah. You know, so what, what is it, when you're speaking about emergence, what are you talking about exactly? Yeah, you know, I tackled this many years ago in my dissertation because I was bugged by the same question. I just was like, what is this emergence? Come on. <laughs> and, um, and it, you know, it confuses so many people and, and the truth is it doesn't need to. It's, it's actually a very simple concept. Emergence is what happens, how the system behaves, right? The outcomes of the system. Emergence is just what happens as a result of the agents and their interaction, the simple rules that they follow when they interact. The problem is when you have hundreds of thousands of agents in a system and they're all interacting, you're having you know, an uncountable number of interactions right? And then knock on effects to those interactions. Well, all those interactions are the collective dynamics that lead to the emergent properties, which is the behavior of the system. So if I say that a system is a flock that is murmurating, like a flock of birds that's beautifully murmurating, that is the emergent property. Um, the emergent property of a bunch of ants that in each individual ant might not have uh, intelligence at any given level. But then when we put all the ants together, you suddenly see intelligence. Well, a lot of people think of that as like, oh, it's magic, intelligence is forming. Well, not really. The intelligence is in the simple rules that are governing the interactions between the agents. And if you look at the simple rules, you'll see it. But what that means is if you want to change the outcomes you're getting from a system, the place where you actually can make that change or have that influence is by influencing and changing the rules that the agents at the local level are facing That's or right. are following. Right. And that's why COVID is actually a perfect example, because yeah. if we follow those rules, we'll have different outcomes. So it's fair to say that one of the key property of a complex system is the difficulty of predicting the result. Hmm. Uh, well, it depends. It, I think it's sometimes difficult to determine how they're behaving that way uh, and the, what is the connection between the simple rules, like for example, when we looked at murmuration, which is that beautiful, you know, elegant thing that we see when birds or fish yeah. are doing that, for 2,500 years of human history, we looked up into the sky and into the oceans and we saw this phenomena and we were mesmerized by it, just like we are today. And, and we thought most of that period that the reason that that was happening was actually because of some A-type personality leader bird that was like guiding all the other birds to do something. That's kind of basically what we thought because we thought, well, that's kind of how it works in humans. And so maybe we'll, th there's a bunch of leader birds. Of course, that doesn't work mathematically because there's not enough time for the communication channel to get, to get the information. So that can't possibly be what it is. But we now know that there's just simple rules. The, the birds uh, co-adjust co co their direction. They maintain a certain distance X and they avoid predators. Those are the three rules. And if you program those three rules, you can get the exact same emergent behavior uh, very easily in, in, a, you know, in a model or, or something else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you mentioned systems thinking has been around for a long time. I'm trying to now connect what you uh, 
mention it as an example for COVID. I mean, that's a real life example. We're all living it today. Mm -hmm. um, do you think um, because of COVID, this is why systems thinking is having sort of a, a renaissance now? There's a question in the chat. Mm -hmm. And the second parter to that is because of COVID and systems thinking seemingly having sort of a, a more heightened awareness among people today, how does that, I'm going to try and tie that to kids now and, and the topic at hand, um, because it, it is highlighted and heightened so much, how can we help our kids and connect them to systems thinking? So it's wow. sort of a two-parter question. It's well, a broad no, it's a good question. <clears throat> I mean, the first part is this whole idea of, you know, this renaissance and systems thinking becoming more popular, I think is true. I would say that I think that the reason that, that it's been happening for longer than we think, and I think it's because things have gotten more, comp more complex, things are happening faster, there's more interrelationships for all kinds of reasons between and among us and the kinds of problems we're trying to solve. And I think because of that, a lot of people's sort of traditional ways of doing things, thinking about things, problem solving, are not giving them the results they want because they're not seeing the complexity of the system they're dealing with. And we know that to deal with that complexity, we need to really think systemically and, and take a different view on real world systems and sort of bring into alignment, like Derek was saying, how we're thinking the system works with how it actually works. So then we can have our solutions sort of fit the problems that we're facing. If that, does that make sense? Yeah, makes ironically, sense. that's a cast too, which yeah. is simply the very simple rule of increased interconnections. Yeah. When you increase interconnections, you increase complexity. And yes. when you increase complexity, people have to deal with that complexity. And the more they have to deal with that complexity, the more they feel like they need systems thinking. Which leads to the <laughs> second part of your question, which is this is why kids today should be, starting now yeah. should start understanding systems thinking complexity, not necessarily in those terms, depending on where you're starting with. But the, the truth is, you know, the world that they live in and the world they're going to continue to live in and graduate into and become problem solvers of is a complex adaptive system. And what we want is we want our school systems to not create kids who go through this traditional system and end up being linear or anthropocentric or mechanistic in the way that they think, we want them to be adaptive. We want them to have a growth mindset and be able to challenge their mental models about things so that they can really match up and have you know, what they're thinking with what things are actually happening. Um, and so we need, the ki we need our kids to move from just being prepared for school to become prepared for life and all the unpredictability and complexity they're gonna face and, you know, basically in a nutshell, you want all of our students to become adults who have a tool set that allows them to think through anything, to understand how they're, you know, understanding things, how they're bringing meaning to ideas so they can use that for any situation um, that comes up. And the only other thing I would add is, we, I sometimes forget to remind us that we're not just talking about developing systems thinkers to solve problems, we want to develop systems thinkers to increase innovation, to increase creativity, to have bolder ideas. Because one of the things we love to say is when you understand how you're thinking about something, ideas that can change the world just become possible because you have that tool set with you through life. Yep. Right? That was like it works. elevator speech. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so at what age can we start to be extremely pragmatic here? At what age can we start introducing uh, some sort of system thinking in the curriculum or in the classroom? You know, the, that's a fantastic question. The, the simple answer is at birth, believe it or not. But it's a question we didn't immediately know the answer to. In fact, there was a time uh, way, way back when DSRP right. was a lot more difficult to understand. And the only teaching of it really occurred with Derek and his doctoral students. And then this is like the origin story. And then there was this NSF grant, which wanted um, Derek's theory to be translated and made more accessible for public use, public consumption. So that was Laura actually was brought onto the grant at that time because of her 
the grant was designed to make these ideas more accessible and her expertise in, in what's called translational research, which is a way to do that. That's right, that's right. And we were on our way to a conference and we were sitting, <laughs> I remember this really You're gonna well. You're gonna tell the story. I'm gonna tell the story. <laughs> it's on tape too. Um, we were sitting in the airport lounge and I remember I said to Derek, this is when we first met, I said, okay, okay, explain this DSRP theory thing to me, but do it in the simplest way possible without losing any of the fidelity to the actual theory. And he did, um, I think it was on the back of a, oh, an airline an ticket, airline an ticket, airline yeah. ticket. Um, Which Laura actually incidentally had framed and like 10 years later gave to me as a gift that airline ticket. So uh, it's kind of a irrelevant piece of the story, but <laughs> I have it on my desk over here. <laughs> But key to the whole start of this uh, journey. <laughs> what was amazing about that moment in the airport was L Laura's response, actually, uh -huh. which w once I was finished sketching out my my you know explanation, nearly nearly without a without a beat, she said, "Okay, so I I know what we need to do." And I said, "Well, what?" And she said, "We need to go teach it to little kids." Mm. At the time, you have to understand today that seems pretty easy, but. At the time, it was only being taught to like doctoral students at Cornell and, and other places. And um, and she said, let's teach it to kids. And, and that started us. We did. We began. Mm -hmm. We did. We, we began teaching it to pre-K, first grade, third graders. And that began that became 20 years of 20 year exploration. work in school districts. And and I think it really um, crystallized how you could distill these ideas uh, into a set of of things that are learnable and teachable. Um, but we know a lot more now, right? We do. We know a lot more today about how to teach it, what are the best practices are, um, yep. and all those kinds of things. Because we've, you know, for two decades, we've been sort of practicing yep. with first graders and kindergartners and fourth graders and 12th graders and, uh, you know, CEOs and yeah. you name it, uh, almost any population. And I just, as a shout out, to this, I will tell you that younger kids, they, they, get, it. they get it naturally, whereas older <clears> kids <throat> and adults, they, they start to, they become in a place where they're sort of untrained. They're they almost trained get, out of it. They almost get coached out of it at yeah. around third grade when we start this Definitely. heavy linear testing. And But they're kind of born systems thinkers and all we have to do is kind of nurture it, but yeah. we don't. Mm -hmm. um, right. Well, their brains are certainly sponges they so are. early on. And I know you mentioned since birth, but most of sort of like the formative years of a, of a kid is in school. Yeah. And we all know, or <laughs> I think that's why we're all here, <laughs> is that school is a very uh, traditional and longstanding um, uh, structure that a lot of us struggle with. So at this point, what are the issues that you see with the current education system? Mm -hmm. And then how can we improve that system in order to infuse the systems thinking for our kids starting at pre-K, let's say when they start mm -hmm. school? Yeah, this is a, a, a fantastic question. I mean, I, I myself struggled mightily in school from K to 12. I didn't do well at all. I was a terrible student. Uh, had terrible time with it and left left high school and just became a mountain guide because that was all I could do. So um, definitely something we need to do uh, is fix the school system for everyone. Fundamentally, this comes down to a, a, an actually a very simple idea, and that is the idea of te teaching kids what to know versus how to know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and and what, we, what we look at that is, is it's a very simple equation, which we say M equals I times T, which is mental models, which is the same as knowledge, is equal to information times uh, thinking. Uh, and thinking is the structuring or organizing of information that makes it a meaningful mental model or knowledge, right? So this basic underlying equation or core uh, uh, is, the, is kind of the core of what's required, the how to think and the what to think, not just the what to think. Because yeah. right now we just do the what to think, which is informational and memorizational. It's not really true learning or building. I think we need to understand that information can be transferred. We can transfer information to each other, but knowledge can't be. 
transferred. Knowledge has to be built. So even if I possess knowledge because I built it, I can't just transfer that knowledge to you. When I try to transfer it to you, it goes as information. So this is captured really well by, um, by a quote that I love, which is you can explain things to people, but you can't understand things to people. Right? And if you think about the depth of that quote, that's the same as you can transfer information, but you can't transfer knowledge. The one thing, this, this sort of simple rule of CAS, of, of the CAS of education that would fix our broken education system, I think, is to shift our focus from information the teacher covers to knowledge the learner builds. If we did that one thing, that would be the simple rule that would, that would tip the system in a completely different direction. This one thing would cascade positive change throughout the system at levels of, of scale. Um, like it would, it would immediately change almost all the terminology of education writ large. It would change the learner and teacher dispositions and mindsets. It would change um, what we measure and what we count as success. Uh, it would change how we design classrooms, for example, even something as specific as the design and layout of a classroom or learning spaces. And, and terminology wise, we probably wouldn't call it a classroom anymore. And we wouldn't call students students, we'd call them learners. And we wouldn't call teachers teachers, we'd call them facilitators, <laughs> things like that. It would change the way we organize libraries. It would change our, our whole concept of schooling would change if we just made that simple shift. Mm -hmm. We have some parents in the audience for, of sure, uh, for sure. And, and I remember a story, Derek, I think it's Derek that uh, uh, told this story in the conference where you are speaking about what you see with your student at Cornell that are top-notch students coming from all over the world. And you, you, you say that you're a bit, I don't know if the word surprise is correct, but that let's say you, you're not totally convinced by the type of uh, be, um, intellectual behavior they have when they come to, to Cornell. Could, could you explain that a bit? Because there's such an obsession, you know, about going to the best school, having the best grade at school. So can you talk a bit about the result you see when you see those top students coming to Cornell? Yeah, I mean, I think both Laura and I noticed this and, and had many conversations about it in the early days of, of doing this. And um, I, I think it comes from that simple rule of if you focus on what the teacher's covering instead of what the teacher, what the learner is building, you end up with a school system that literally incentivizes doing well at school, but not necessarily doing well at life. Yep. Right. So a lot of the people that are the cream of the crop of our educational system are actually people that are just really, really good at doing school. Yeah. And a lot of doing school is strategic compliance and ritual compliance. It's not authentic engagement. It's a, it's a form of strategic compliance. You pay attention to what the teacher's covering. You read her, her or his facial and, and body language of what he, what he or she wants to hear, and you're able to give it back to him. My problem in school was always that I that I uh, wasn't reading all that. I was just so engaged in what we were talking about that I thought we were talking about those things. And I thought it was about the stuff that we were talking about and that it, you could engage it, but it wasn't. It was about getting the right answer or you know, taking the right test and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, one of, the, one of the sort of more well-known sayings is, you know, sometimes, a lot of times students come to us information full but they lack an ability with knowledge. They're not knowledge able, meaning yeah. you can't, it's very hard to give an unstructured, unspecified sort of problem to work on. They, they need a very specific rubric to follow. And, and because they're used to focusing on the content and the information rather than the thinking process in how they're uh, understanding these kinds of ideas. So we, we've, we've seen that, but- Absolutely. They're a product of the school system. And so how do we start to help schools or even programs? Because going back to terminology, we keep calling schools schools, but then there's, you know, um, other programs more broadly um, as a term. How do we help them start to infuse uh, systems thinking across different um, age ranges? Um, I, I resonate fully with what you just said, Derek, with, with regards to um, the people who learn you know, how to do school the best. I was one of those. I knew how to do school <laughs> and did okay at it, did well at it. 
but I, it wasn't only until, you know, I'm going to say recently that it, you know, how am I going to use all this information? Right, what am right. I using it for? Right. And, and to the best of uh, what end? Um, but just to come back to that, uh, the school program question, how do we help them help our kids? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think the one thing that we need to start with, which we have found after being in schools, is the first thing you need to understand is you can teach all of the same content, which has been well-developed and organized and is, is great content, but you have to just teach it a little differently, meaning we can, we can just infuse some of the language of thinking skills and develop that awareness of how we're thinking things through in the existing standards and curriculum that, that there are. So we, we, in the beginning, you know, teachers would panic that we were just scrubbing everything and starting over. That's not the case. No. We're just changing sort of the way that things are taught and embedding it into. Let me give you a really, um, I hope it's not too long, but it's a good example of what we mean. So we start, you know, we start by just helping teachers develop the language around thinking and, in, and infusing that into lessons. And in a particular, a large school district in Virginia, we were working with a pre-K teacher, pre-K teacher, you know, kids are three and four years old. And she was about to do a lesson oh, on- This is the fire truck. Yeah, yeah, this, this is the fire truck story. <laughs> That's what we call it. Um, it's like we have our greatest hits. Yeah, that's a good fire truck story. I wasn't um, sure why, which one you were gonna tell. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, so she's a pre-K teacher in a very large district and they had this, this standard, this you know, uh, state standard to teach the concept of community helpers. And one of the things that they do in that lesson is they bring you know, police officers and firemen and, and all kinds of uh, community helpers to the school to talk to the students. And they've taught this lesson forever, forever for like, uh, you know, two to five decades, yeah. they've taught this lesson. So it was, the, so it was getting up to the time mm -hmm. when the firemen would come and they actually bring the fire truck to the school for little kids to see it and to explain what they do in the community and how they do things. And in previous years, they would just, they would go out, they would hear from the firemen, look at the fire truck, and they would come inside and they would build a cardboard model of a fire truck. Well, after we had worked with this district, what this one teacher did is she actually taught children just one idea, which is about parts and holes, that everything is a system that's organized into parts and holes. She did like a five, 10 minute lesson, just about parts and holes, every hole's a part, every part's a hole. They made up a little song, which I will not sing on tape for you. <laughs> Trust me, that's a good choice. <laughs> anyway, after this lesson, the kids went out and they looked at the fire truck. They did all the same lesson. They came in. So this is remarkable because they, they did the lesson exactly the same, same but lesson. they just did like a the language, like a three minute intervention around system thinking of, of one of the four DSRP rules, the S rule. Right. And so the kids came into the classroom and they started to build their cardboard fire truck. Well, guess what? The, the fire truck that they built actually had, the old, the old version had a box and a steering wheel and a front. The new version, after they sort of were introduced to the concept that there were a bunch of parts and that every part on the truck had parts, it had, um, it had a bell, it had little a, a ladder, it had rungs on the ladder, it had all kinds of stuff on the back. The teachers was, were shocked was, because they had done this for yeah, so long. It was like far, far more detailed. Well, here's the other thing. Then they also, at the beginning of the year, they, they draw self-portraits of their bodies, right? Of themselves. They lay down on a piece of paper, or they trace their body, and then they start to fill in how they think they look. Well, guess what? That year, they all had more parts. Every single one of them had more parts in their picture. And it's crazy. Which and means they're seeing more, more right? Structure. They're literally seeing more of the fire truck, more of their body, more, more of themselves. You know, because they're at, they're, they know to look for parts of parts and systems. And last part, because this is a remarkable thing about transfer. So I guess about two months after that, they had a lockdown, you know, which is a very scary thing for pre-K kids. So, mm -hmm. you know, they had a lockdown where the teacher, you know, turns off the lights, locks the door. She puts them all under their desks or in a clock. Like it's a, it's a scary event. And after the lockdown was over, and this that's right this actually makes me kind of throw a little girl a little girl walked up to the teacher and she said miss mm -hmm. callahan she said i'm really scared and i don't understand can we part hold the lockdown 
can we talk about the parts of that? She knew how to ask. Like she knew that she needed to understand it more deeply. She had a language of metacognition. So she asked the very specific question, which related to that one simple lesson. So they see, it's just, it's remarkable that it's that simple. It's literally that simple. It's just in changing the language. And I mean, there's all kinds of things. I mean, yeah, I mean, that, that example is so, so remarkable. If you like if from an educational theory perspective and practice perspective, I mean, there's so many things going on there. The fact that such a small treatment led to such a big effect. Yeah. Uh, the fact that you have literally uh, just extremely far transfer happening that is being motivated yeah. and asked for by name by children of that age. Like transfer is kind of the holy grail of education, of, of learning theory, because mm -hmm. transfer is something that if you can get it to be high, transfer means like I learn something in one domain and I apply it to another, right? I, I transfer the learning. Well, it turns out that what transfers is actually the structure of, of the, the ideas. So what that little girl was doing was going from fire truck to her body to a lockdown. And she was transferring her learning to those different domains and also doing sort of one little piece of system thinking at a higher level, it was, it's just kind of remarkable that that happened as a result of that. Yeah. And we shouldn't gloss over that. The thing that transfers between and among topics year to year is the, is how they're mm. thinking about it. The skills that they're using to understand not the content, not the content. So I can learn part whole in math and then I can go and apply it to science and I can apply it to music and I can apply it to a conflict on the playground, any of those things. And, and that's, the, that's the key. That's why systems thinking is so important for kids is it gives that ability year to year, topic to topic to have a, like a, an ability or a, an ease with, with knowledge and understanding those. And things. all of that happened, like those teachers really were trained mm -hmm. for a few hours in systems thinking. And then like that particular teacher just asked, okay, I have this lesson. What could I do with it? And we said, okay, just do one of the DSRPs. Let's do S. Doesn't matter which one. Just do a, and she said, what if, what if we did like a song and then we did like a, like a little visual, like every part's a whole, every hole's a part, you know? And, and we said, that sounds great. Do that. It was like a three minute intervention, yep. you know, a three minute little treatment of system thinking and the kids got it. And they went right outside and they deconstructed with their minds the fire truck better than they ever had before in all the years that these teachers had taught this, which means their drawings of fire truck were more elaborate. The fire truck they actually built was more elaborate and their understanding, their mental model of the fire truck was more elaborate. Sure. So, so can we dig a little bit in, a, in the concept of mental model? Mm -hmm. And uh, do, so, so what I would like you to do, if you can, is, of course, to explain what a mental model is. Uh, and then if you have any uh, example where you use the DSRP and, and maybe also let's repeat what DSRP is for some people sure. that arrive later. And, you know, uh, and how did you use DSRP in school to show to, to kids that reality is a question of perception? basically. So if you have any examples, so three questions, sorry. So again, I repeat, <laughs> <laughs> so three questions in one. Do I need to repeat or are we fine? Uh, mental model, DSRP repeat, and- Example, example. Oh, example. Uh, example of- How, oh, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. so I, I'll, I'll start that off and I, I, I trust that Derek will chime in. Um, so mental models, as Derek was saying earlier, are um, knowledge, their concepts, and they're comprised of the information, the content that we're thinking about and how we've structured it through thinking processes. And we, when we teach this, uh, regardless of the audience, when we say structure or thinking, we mean four things, <clears throat> how you're distinguishing things, how they're related to one another, the perspectives you're taking on them, and um, the, the uh, what did I forget? I forgot one of the four. Part whole. Part whole. Oh, <laughs> we just talked about. Part Sorry, whole. I was off. I thought about that. Systems. You know how we're organizing ideas into systems. So, anytime you have new information coming into you to build meaning or a mental model, you are actually structuring that content using DSRNP, and that forms the concept, the mental model, 
in your brain. What was the second part? And you, and you need all four of them and they work together. Yeah. So if you break things down into parts using S, then you can use relationships to relate the parts. Yes. Right? And of course, when you make a new relationship, you're going to have to distinguish it. So you need distinctions in order to distinguish it. And then you could look at that whole system from a, one perspective or another perspective. So the system might change depending on the perspective that you're looking at. So there are dynamical rules that work together, which system thinking is, is itself a CAS, a complex adaptive system. And the simple rules of that the, the sort of simple things that are that are modular and happen over and over and over again are distinctions, part whole systems, relationships, and perspectives. And we just call that DSRP because of the yeah. initials. It doesn't matter what the initials are. Um, but, so the third question is, what, did, did, do you do any exercise with kids around this concept of mental model? And if yes, any example that you can share with us? Sure, sure. I mean, there's a million things. Millions, so, and we have tons of resources online that we can share with you. Well, so for examples of, of uh, mental models from school. So one example I can, I can share is uh, in a fifth grade math class, uh, a student was trying to build an understanding of the difference between a mathematical expression and an equation. And he was really struggling with it. And his teacher kept saying, mm. think about it, think about it. And he finally said to her, he, he said, Mrs. Nolan, he's like, I don't know what you mean when you tell me to think about it. And she said, well, let's look at the parts of each. Let's look about what are the parts of an expression? What are the parts of the equation? Are they the same? Are they different? How are they related? Um, and they drew a little map of yeah. an equation, what an equation is, and do a little map of a, what a, expression. an expression yeah. is. Yep. And, um, and the student, didn't he? Yeah, he noticed that there was one difference, the equal sign, right? That in an equation, there's an equal sign, in an expression, there isn't. And so that is that student building a mental model of a mathematical expression or the difference between expression and equation using those thought patterns to understand the content that's being taught. Does that make sense? Yeah? Yes, it does. Sorry, I was playing with my mute. Another button. example is, you know, teacher who teaches, you know, pond ecology, and oh, yeah. she had the, the little kids, uh, you know, built they built a pond in the play, in the room with like paper, paper and, and markers, markers and, and then they pretended to be a frog and looked at the whole pond ecology from the frog perspective. And then they pretended to be a lily pad and looked at the whole frog, the whole pond ecology from the lily pad and the water molecule. And, you know, so they're taking perspectives of various things, sometimes not even human perspectives, like, yeah. you know, just things and looking at it from those perspectives and seeing different relationships and things like that. And the kids just have this very ecological view uh, as a result. And of course, you know, we can give you examples all the way up to 12th grade. And uh, what, what, in, what changes is actually just the sophistication of the content, right. the information. Here, but here. the structure doesn't change from, from kindergarten all the way to PhD. The underlying structure of systemic thought does not change at all. It's just these four things that are repeating like Lego blocks modularly and fractally. Which is why we go all around and, and really try to, you know, get the idea across that systems thinking is able to be learned and able to be taught. I mean, yeah. before, you know, a while ago, it, it's, it sort of had been, been seen to be this big, heady academic field that nobody could crack into and that had no practical use. And we've really been working <laughs> I mean, a while ago. When I came to the field, I kid you not, when I, when I came to the field, I, I was shocked because I was like, man, this seems like such a cool thing. I want to know what it is. And the answer to like, how do I learn systems thinking was literally like, well, you spend 30 years understanding these thousand models and then you'll know systems thinking. And I just thought, that's crazy. That can't be the answer. <laughs> like, <laughs> there has to be a different answer. That can't possibly be an answer to a thing that every single child should be learning and every human being should be knowing. Yeah. Well, yes, it, it sounds as though there's, um, what's clear to me and I, I think all of us here is at first coming into this session, some of us probably thought, oh, is there a way to infuse systems thinking as a thing, as a course, as a class 
into the curriculum. But what you've shared with us is really that it is just integrated into the current content that is being shared and taught and uh, hopefully learned by by the students. Um, And we want to improve upon that. And there's some questions now that um, that are coming in all around. Well, this is great. Kids can learn this and embed this in their learning. How do we spread this more amongst teachers and facilitators who are out there? Um, is there are do you have an out- online course or are there places where teachers can should go? Is it at the district level? Is it yeah. and and again when I say district level that's specific to schools, but again there's so many different programs out there. How do you think about the sort of promotion of changing the way teachers facilitators um, work with their students? Yeah, I mean I I mean there are so many different. Um, ways to start. So we've had districts that literally started with one kindergarten art teacher reaching out to us, reading our book, Thinking at Every Desk, which has a lot of examples of school, you know, different level of school lessons and how to embed these things to a superintendent of, you know, the 12th largest school in the nation saying, hey, I'm not seeing the results I want. And I know I need something different, but I don't know what it is. Can you come talk to me about systems thinking? So there's a variety of ways um, that you can come to it. I would say we have a lot of resources and we can share things in the chat um, available for educators. We do have, there was a documentary film actually uh, that followed us into schools for about three years and interviewed teachers and students and showed the methods in the classroom. Uh, we can share, do, should we share a link to that or? Um, it's called Rethinking. Yeah, it's called Rethinking. It's an hour long documentary that they did on our, on our work in schools. Mm-hmm. Um, probably the best thing is this link here. I'll put it in the chat. Yes. Is um, everything's in that link. <laughs> if you go to that page, it kind of has everything for educators in it. So it, it's sort of a smorgasbord. And at the top, there's a bunch of blue things because it's kind of an overwhelming list of, of materials and resources and posters and all oh, kinds of things. Brilliant. But at the top, the blue stuff is kind of. Um, kind of like the, the cherry pick some of the most important things that you might want to look at. But, but just cause this is what, mm. like, this is what I do. Yeah. Okay. So even though there's all these resources and fancy printed things and books and movies really at the core, it's just whatever you're teaching or learning, ask four questions. What are the distinctions I'm making? Right. How am I framing this issue? What are the distinctions I'm making? Um, how are the how are the parts of this thing organized, right? What are the parts and how are they organized? What are the relationships between and among those parts of a system? And what are the different perspectives, anthropomorphic and non-anthropomorphic, that I could look at this thing from to better understand it? So if you're somebody out there in the audience who's literally teaching, you know, seventh grade math take a lesson you're doing and say, what are the things that matter in here? What are the distinctions? How are these ideas organized into systems? Are the relationships I'm explicating or not? Um, Is there a different perspective I can look at this thing from that would would help people understand it better, right? So- What Laura's talking about, we call Thinkquery. It's a tool and there's actually a website. I just put the link in, you know, you just go to that website and you can see different levels of questions. So like introductory levels of questioning to more advanced. Yeah. And there's actually a little tool in there where you can type in words and it'll fill in the question for you. So it's kind of yeah. fun to play yeah. around. And I, I say that because I don't want people to think that systems thinking can only be done with very particular tools. Systems thinking is literally just a different way of seeing things, inquiring about things and discussing things in a classroom setting. You don't have to have fancy tools. You don't have to have software. You don't have to, you just have to have a mindset of these are the things I need to be paying attention to because it speaks to kids' brains because that's how they're organizing their understanding. They don't know it, but that is how they're organizing and creating meaning. So if you speak into it, you'll have different effects. And that that thing you said, Nancy, is so profound. Uh, it, It so highly influenced our work in the early days was in the early days, when we taught, when we even thought as educators about thinking or about systems thinking or anything like that, it was always like, oh yeah, we totally are behind you there. Let's let's make a, let's do a course yeah. sophomore year, yeah, and it'll be called the you know the systems mm-hmm. thinking intro course, and it'll be sophomore year, and we'll you know it'll be great, 
And we would always say, no, the thinking is you're, you're supposed to think the whole case, the whole <laughs> continuum. You don't just think on sophomore year, no. right? We had a te- I had a teacher literally say to me once in a training, you know, um, which, which sort of just, again, just kind of shows a little bit of the mental model. She said, this stuff is so great, Dr. Cabrera, you know, uh, it, I use it a lot in English uh, on, on Wednesdays and on math on, on Thursdays, but I don't use it in history on Fridays. <laughs> and I just said to her, just change the, change the thing, the sentence a little bit. I use thinking on Wednesdays, right, in English. I use thinking on Thursdays in math, but I don't use thinking on Fridays in history. Just change that sentence and you'll see the flaw. Yes. So we really have to undo that thinking of like, oh, it's just going to be a course. Yeah. It's got to be. It's it's thinking. It's it's systemic thinking. Yeah. You're using it all the time. It's the way you understand things. And it's easy to embed in everything. It should be embedded in everything. It shouldn't be just a course. So I I just wanted to hit on that that point you made, Nancy, because it's so important. Yeah, well, that was what was uh, enlightening um, for me, at least, in what you said is that it's integrated at every single level, dimension, um, yeah. area. And uh, one question that's coming in here is Is there any sort of rubric that would help in assessing systems thinking capabilities yeah. of students? Yes, yeah. lots of that. rubrics. Yes, we actually have. Um, in Thinking at Every Desk, there's a chapter there, on, rubric, yeah. on the rubric. Yeah. for thinking. There's also a district in uh, Wisconsin that actually adopted national standards of thinking skills that are based on DSRP. Yeah. And we actually have a dra- we actually have drafted our own what we would propose to be national Rubric standards of thinking skills. So we could um, I think that might be in that link, but we'll make sure that that's available. But it's basically you know a continuum of skill building across those things. But again, touching. You know, when I talk about the information that the teacher covers versus the learning that the student builds, the knowledge that they build, the information that the teacher covers is the content curriculum of any educational edifice. And that's the third rail of education, right? That's the that's where you get electrocuted when you try to change education. When you try to touch their beloved content, things go awry. And you have a fight on your hands. So, so I don't want to. I don't want to uh, underestimate what we're talking about here. It's the equivalent politically of you know healthcare. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's it's you're touching the third rail of education, which is let's upset the apple cart on the curriculum. Yeah. And that is that is not an easy thing to change. There's a lot of lock in. There's a lot of uh, protectionism. There's a lot of tribalism going on around that curriculum. So yeah, it's easy to change if you have the will to change it. But, but getting the will, that's not a simple problem. Right. We have people from all over the, the world. So there's, a question, there's some question around the concept. Does, does this approach can work for any type of, let's say, culture? Or mm-hmm. do you see any issue with that? No. I don't think I don't I don't see any issue. I mean, these things are literally universal to how we think about things and how we build meaning, other than translating them into various languages. Um, I would say that they're equally. Our new book is coming out uh, soon. uh, That'll be a compendium of the amazing amount of research studies that are done on 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 DSRP and 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 all of its uh, implications. And what you'll see is that this is something that's actually happening at very tiny scales that you wouldn't expect. So it's not just cultural difference. I mean, we're talking, there are, there are organisms that are doing, yes. making distinctions and taking perspectives. And, um, and we see this throughout the research at every level of scale. So I don't think it's affected culturally. There's also cultural studies, anthropological Logical studies study. that find the same patterns inside of very, very different cultures, including cultures that have not been contacted or, or only have recently been contacted. So yeah. um, I don't see that there's a cultural issue other than translating you know, language across to make it the right, the right uh, wording and things like that. Yeah, 
-hmm. From a very practical point of view, uh, I would love you to speak a bit about the programs you teach at Cornell and also the certification that you are proposing for people to really have a sense of what exists around. Yep. Uh, okay, so at Cornell, <clears throat> we teach in the graduate school um, and we teach systems thinking and modeling. And we also teach organizational design change and leadership or how do you lead big systems to be agile and adaptive. We also run the graduate certificate program which is a, a, like a concentration inside of the degree. But, but we the also, one that's available to everybody. Yeah, in the the one we have that's available for everyone is offered through eCornell as a, a certification um, in systems thinking and mapping and leadership is in there too. There's also two courses on LinkedIn, one on systems thinking and one on adaptive leadership. And, and those two courses are much shorter. The Cornell course is kind of, Jeff, Jeff you know, cause I think you just yeah. finished it, but it's sort of a bigger commitment. You get yeah. a certification from Cornell. The LinkedIn courses are sh much shorter. They're like maybe 30 minutes or something. Yeah. One's so on- One's on adaptive leadership and one's on systems thinking. And then in our own academic lab, uh, Cabrera Research Lab, we have actually um, developed three skills courses, one in systems thinking, one in mapping, and one in systems leadership. Those are all about four to six hours of um, online instruction, you know, uh, asynchronous. And we did that because, you know, there's our goal as a lab is to really increase use and public understanding of these ideas and give as many possible tools that people can use to embed them in whatever system they're in. Um, of course, near and dear to our origin story and our hearts is, you know, education, K to 12 education and starting earlier rather than later with these with these skills. So I just shared the link for that'll give you all those different courses that are on that page. So yeah. there's lots of different options. If you want a very short option, um, if you want kind of a middle option, or if you want the real deep dive option, there's lots of different options. Yeah. We offer along those, Laura mentioned that we offer three cor skills courses. We also offer three or uh, two Certification. Really very deep dive live certifications um, that are, that are you know, if time. you want to go the yeah. whole way and understand things at a deep level. Yeah, we do. Well, this has been fantastic. We have a, a few minutes left until the top of the hour. Are there any last, uh, and I won't say final because this is never final, yeah, never final. <laughs> words that you want to share with us? Uh, the us or the audience? Oh, the audience, the audience, sorry, with, yeah. with, with the audience, yes. And, and, and I'll infuse one little, it might open up a can of worms, but um, maybe there's a, a part two session that we could do um, sometime in a few months. But we've talked a lot about uh, schools, programs, mm -hmm. teachers, facilitators. There's one big piece about revolving around parents, yeah. families yeah. that we didn't touch upon today. But obviously we're the closest to our kids and how do we help them? Um, but maybe that th those are some of the words that you can share with us at the end of this session. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, it, it, if nothing else is that you don't have to touch the third rail uh, <laughs> yes. uh, be, when you're dealing with parents. And so parent education and systems thinking is much easier because there's very little politics, frankly. Uh, I mean, to be blunt, um, there's, there's very little politics. They, we, and so parent groups that teach this stuff, we have a, a really great parent group that works with uh, people on the, um, on the spectrum in India uh, and, and lots of different parent type groups. And, and um, they, they work fantastic. Parents can pick it up very quickly and help their kids understand things. Uh, not, just the, not just school kind of things, no, like, but- how to, how to be a better person, how to, you know, ethics, you know, all, everything under the sun. So yeah, we have, we have led parent mm -hmm. workshops. We love them. Uh, we have done them inside of school districts and independently. And, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of the similar process where we just change the way we're inquiring about things when we're dialoguing with our children. The one, the one real beauty of working with parents is you can work across not just school topics, but like, how are you understanding yourself? How are you understanding your relationships with your friends? When this conflict comes out, how do we perceive risk? You know, when they're teenagers, really important. How do you get them to take the trash out, feed the dogs? Like there's anything you can talk about with parents and you can use these 
system thinking ideas and this sort of way of talking about things to change the conversation. And if I were to leave with a kind of a final thought, it would just be that in the, in the several decades of work that we've done, the thing that always comes back to me on, on this question, of like, how do you get started? How do you make it happen? All that kind of stuff. It's just kind of like practice, like yeah. daily practice. It's not something that you're going to master in one sitting. It's not something you're going to master from taking one course. It's something that if you make it part of your daily thinking, yeah. then you'll just do a little bit every day. You'll, you'll like yeah. play with part whole or you'll play with perspective or you'll play with distinction making. And suddenly you'll realize, oh my God, distinction making is so rich and robust, way more complex than I ever thought it could be. And yet it's, it's just making things different from each other. Like, yeah. how is that so complex? You know, all boundary conditions come from distinction making, for example. And yeah. so what I would suggest is just make it part of your daily practice. That's why we created system thinking daily on Facebook, because it's, it's so critical that it's daily mm -hmm. and that it's just little bites. Don't try to eat the whole elephant. Just take little bites and take them daily. And Listen. if you do that in six months, you'll be like, oh my God, my whole, my whole mindset yeah. has changed. Well, I, I think all of our mindsets have changed a little bit for the better today. Um, just want to thank you so much, Lauren Derek, sure. for this hour with you. Um, we've learned a lot today, taken away some key insights, uh, and we'll continue the work of preparing our kids um, for the future. Awesome. So thanks for all the resources, and, and maybe we'll do a part two one of these days. But thank yeah. you we'd again. Love, we'd love to, yeah. You got thank it, you yes. for having us. Yes, <laughs> hey, th thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Take care. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone, and have a good rest of the day.